This is the Healthcare.ai live broadcast with the Health Catalyst data science team, where we discuss the latest machine learning topics with hands-on examples. And here's your host, Levi Thatcher. Hi, I'm Levi Thatcher. Thanks for joining us. This is the hands-on healthcare machine learning broadcast. This is my co-host, Mike Masson. Do you know? Hi, Mike. Hey, Levi. What do we got on tap for today? Thanks for joining us, everybody. We've got a great show planned. Uh, today we're going to be going through the mailbag as usual. We've got a lot of user questions and some of them are really interesting. Then we'll be doing a new segment which we're calling uh, Machine Ooh. Learning Legend. Oh, so yeah. We want to kind of go back into the archives of machine learning and... Digging deep. Yeah, and look at, you know, who, who came up with the techniques, how, how they got to where they are now and uh, what, what those techniques are doing today. And then we'll move into the, the main event which is um, Workflow. We're going to be talking about uh, how you train and build and deploy a machine learning model in a healthcare space. Uh, Very practical. Yeah, specifically using healthcare AI. So that that we've had a lot of people asking, you know, kind of a general walkthrough of how that works. So awesome. Uh, it'll be great to show that. And then finally, we'll be talking with the the chat, interacting, and uh, hoping to get questions from the users. Before we start, we have the, the usual housekeeping reminders. Uh, you can log into YouTube and, and chat in the, in the chat box on the right or just below the, the video. Uh, if you want to watch on YouTube, you can click the YouTube logo in the, in the lower, left, or lower right corner of, our, of your screen. And uh, we'll be definitely into the code this week, so if you want to change the resolution on YouTube, the gear is the, uh, the way to do that. And then finally, uh, please throw us a bone and subscribe, and uh, you can be updated when we're going to do a new one. Although the shows are always right this time, right here, right now. So yeah, we have blog posts going as well, which you'll get notified in the, the subscription there. So check that out. Great. So without further ado, let's get going. Yes. Yeah, so what's in the mailbag? What do we have? So the mailbag. We had a, a user ask us. You know, they they said they're just getting into data science, and they're kind of curious about some of the the use cases of data science in the healthcare domain um, and kind of like how we tailored healthcare AI to, to meet those needs and kind of what, what the project life cycle is, has been like and what, what the end goal of it, the yeah. project is. Yeah, yeah. So the idea with machine learning healthcare and our stance is to be super practical. So typically a health system will want to improve X, Y, or Z. Typically these are things like readmission rates, infection rates, you know, things like that, you know, it's mortality rates. And so when we interact with them, we help them to create a model to actually look forward, not only so they know, okay, well, who in the past has had an infection, but who in our hospital will have an infection today, whether it's something like uh, central line infection or maybe sepsis. And so the idea is that using healthcare AI, it's very easy for an analyst to both create the model on data that the hospital has and then to actually deploy it so that each day a clinician gets updated predictions as to how to prioritize, you know, their limited resources. Yeah, that's great. And that, that's actually exactly what today's show is going to be about, right? Perfect. Yeah. So that's great. Thanks for that question. We had another question about, uh, about master's programs. You know, somebody wanting to get into data science. You know, what, what's, the, what's our opinion on business analytics programs from business schools versus uh, data science programs from tech schools? Because they're largely the same kind of uh, course material, you know? But how important is the spin to getting a job? It's a great question. And when you say tech school, that's like the computer science department. Yeah, exactly. So I, th I think it, it comes down to, you know, what kind of job you want to get. And um, I think next week we're actually going to talk about different career paths in data science, but just a little teaser there. But, you know, there, there are some jobs where your main role will be business intelligence, which is kind of like... You know, you're taking data from within the company and uh, presenting it in a format that helps business executives make decisions about, you know, whether they should buy a new company or build a new building or things like that. And uh, I think from from a, a business school degree might might tailor well to that type of position. Mm -hmm. But if you're looking to be a hardcore kind of machine learning programmer, uh, you might be better off with a tech school degree. Meaning, but, like, uh, get a CS or computer science degree and go towards maybe the the route where you're learning how to build software. Yeah. Or, you know, the data science masters might be more tailored to, to machine learning than the business analytics program would. But I think either program is a good way to go for, for any type of job. It's all about the experience you have and how you market yourself. Yeah, that is imp definitely important. 
And then we've had one, one last question for today is um, people have been asking what we've been working on lately. Like, what's going on with the healthcare AI package? What's new? Well, how is nice of you to ask. <laughs> Mike's been in the code quite a lot with some impressive stuff. So we've been we've been building uh, we've been building tools lately, you yeah. know, to help 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 people building models, evaluate their models, evaluate their data, make it better. So two two functions that we we were excited about are, are one is kind of a you know when your model is in production, which we'll talk about later, and you want to evaluate the the performance. You know now we have a, a handy dandy easy to use function that'll evaluate the performance for you. Uh, all you have to do is feed it some uh, columns that you've pulled down from SQL. And then the other one we've been working on is on the front end of model creation. So null values in your data, you know, you can count your nulls and in your training data set that may be consistent, but you know, if you're if you're using a data source that's constantly refreshing like a real data source would, you might not have a sense of whether or not a a piece of data is going to be available an hour after the patient checks in or if it's going to take a week for that data to be available. So we've, we've written a tool that will help, uh, help users decide you know, which, that, which columns they can pull in. That is super handy. So we've run into that issue frequently. The idea is that a health system wants to predict readmissions and they'll, they'll ask us, they'll say, okay, well, can we predict it you know, upon patient arrival? Or can we predict it 24 hours or 48 hours after arrival? And so what this function does is it goes and checks your data in the EMR, say, and looks and sees, okay, well, you know, 24 hours in, we have this many columns available. You know, more than half of those columns are filled or 75% of them are filled. So you can say, okay, well, you know, maybe 24 hours in, we have enough data to actually create a prediction for clinicians at that point, and you move on from there. So That's awesome. Great work on that. So from the, from the chat, we have somebody saying that they started the uh, Jose Portilla class that we recommended last week. Oh. Glad to hear that's going really well. Yeah. And uh, best of luck is continuing. Keep us updated on how it's going. Awesome. So machine learning legend, it's a new, new segment. Yeah, yeah. So the idea is that we want to change things up, have these you know, segments and do some vignettes, talk about pillars in the field that we look up to that we've learned a ton from that have built the tools that we use in our jobs every day. And the first person we're going to profile is Leo Bryman, who's actually a professor at UC Berkeley for decades. And uh, have you ever been to Berkeley? No, I never have. Lovely town, I hear. I'd love to make it out there. Just a nice little educational enclave, <laughs> I hear. And so Leo was there for decades, distinguished professor of statistics, founded a lot of the field of machine learning, and what he's mainly known for, one of the one of the many things, is helping found CART. And Mike, what what is CART? CART is a is an acronym that stands for classification and regression trees. So it's an ensemble-based machine learning method where you take a whole lot of decision trees and lump them together with a, a subset of the data or a subset of the features that you have and it's kind of like crowdsourcing your machine learning. So oh, yeah. instead of a single decision tree, you're going to use an ensemble of them. And you, know, you, you gain a lot of uh, statistical power, and you get a lot of nice benefits by combining them. That's right. From chaos comes order? Exactly. Something so, like that. Something. So yeah. go ahead. Oh, well, Leo, yeah. So the random forest algorithm we've talked about a lot, and Professor Bryman was key to that, like Mike mentioned. And he, of course, was building on other people. He stood on the shoulders of other giants. And so there was this algorithm out there that was, you know, a sort of a proto-random forest. And what Professor Bryman did was added on something called bagging. And this is aggregated boosting. And so, Mike, you know, you've had statistics courses. Boosting, you know, what, what is that? So many weird words. Yeah, so they, they all kind of, you know, mean the same thing where, you know, you're going to take a sample, a subsample of your data set and use that to, uh, you know, as, as one kind of group, and then you take a different subsample of the data and you use that as another group, and then you keep taking subsamples and, and then throwing them back into the bag when you're, when you're done, and, and then kind of take the aggregate of all the different, uh, you know, sam whatever the results from the, all the different samples are. Yeah, exactly, that's amazing. And so thanks to him and this work that he accomplished, we have the modern random forest algorithm, which is one of our favorites. So it's robust on many types of different data sets. It's very easy to use. There aren't a lot of hyperparameters that you need to tune, if any. Sometimes you say, OK, I want 300 trees instead of 200 trees if you get crazy, or maybe you know 1,000 or whatever, depending on how crazy you are. But the idea is that it's super robust, helps people get into machine learning. 
And it really teaches me that you know, interesting math is going on all the time. So people are developing things in the math community that, that help us. So when you're in your calculus courses or stats courses, like, it's, it's amazing what can be accomplished from what you learn in there. And um, Leo, Professor Bryman, also was helpful in the development of Lasso, another one of our favorite algorithms. Mm -hmm. So let me just pull up the name of what he did here. So he actually was, you know, of course, standing on the shoulders of giants himself with Lasso as well. And he developed something called the non-negative garrote, which Rob Tishrani at Stanford later turned into the lasso. So Professor Bryman contributed to, to two of the foundational algorithms for healthcare AI, the lasso and the random forest. And in the show notes afterwards, we'll throw in a, a fantastic YouTube video where he describes how he had this bolt of lightning sort of insight that came, helped him come up with the random forest algorithm. It's a fascinating story about using radar to detect what type of ships the Russians had in certain places during the Cold War. We'll put that up in the show notes, check it out. So he, he's our first machine learning legend that, that we're excited to talk about. And please, you know, read his Wikipedia profile, read his papers. There's a paper we'll show right here that was cited 26,000 times. So here's the Wikipedia profile and there's the paper. So it looks pretty humble from 2001, but 26,000 Reference citations? That's a lot. I come from academia, like I got a PhD in, you know, five. You know, if anybody cites your work, it's like, woo, woo people care? People read it? Wow, that's amazing. But 26,000, unbelievable. So we'll, we'll throw the paper up in the show notes afterwards as well. But uh, w w what's next on the docket? So next we have the main event. Uh, we're going to be looking at how to build a healthcare uh, machine learning model using healthcare AI. And I think it's, it's useful to, to know that we're going to be kind of focusing on the high level and, and then diving into how healthcare AI can address each step of the process. Because we're trying to make it a, the pro, you know, it's a long pipeline of, of things you have to do to go from idea that you're trying, you know, model that you're trying to build to actually having it serve up predictions. And so, you know, healthcare AI is one of the main, main goals is to make that process easier. Definitely, definitely. And you know, please reach out in the chat or through email. We want to make sure they understand what we're working on and we'd love to have you know, an interaction. You know, we need you and your, your, your contributions and your questions to, to make this helpful to everybody. And so we're, we're going to look at the, the computer here for a minute. And what we're going to be starting with is our studio. We've talked about this before. So our studio is the main environment in which you interact with R, it, perhaps the best way to interact with R. And how we're going to start out is by loading in healthcare AI by something like this. And again, you can refer back to this later on. This link will be posted in perpetuity. So don't feel like you need to follow all these steps, but just you know, kind of enjoy and pick up what you can. But the idea is whenever you start with healthcare AI in our studio, you can pull up these built-in docs. And this is the, the main way to read up on how to do certain things. And so you'll see that we have a description as to each of the steps. And if you click through these links, you'll see that there are notes as to how to use the functions, argument definitions, examples. And these examples are checked every time we check in pieces of code. So that we break something, you know, it yells at us and we can fix the example so it's awesome for you. But so what's the first step in getting started with uh, developing a model, Mike? Well, the first step is to figure out what your model is actually going to do. You know, do you want it to do are you trying to predict readmission rates? Are you trying to predict uh, length of stay? You got to figure out what's what's most valuable for your organization or most fun for your project. Yeah, definitely. So, what what's the business question of interest? See, we we shouldn't. If you're working for a health system, of course, the, the business question comes first, and that's what should drive the machine learning. So, things we've been doing it's been a lot of classification type work. So. Is somebody going to get sepsis or not? You know, a central line infection or not? Be readmitted within 30 days or not? And so why, why have we chosen those things? Yeah, you yeah. Know, are those random the, choices? Or? Well, so great question. The idea is that the this is what health systems are worried about. They want to decrease you know the infection rates, readmission rates, because oftentimes they get penalized from the government, from Medicare or CMS if you're in the field. CMS issues penalties for exceeding certain thresholds in terms of readmission rates. 
And so that, that's where they come to us to say, okay, well, we've used descriptive statistics. You know, our analysts using you know, Click haven't been able to achieve these gains that we need, so let's use some machine learning and get this forward guidance. And so that's where we, where we start is saying, okay, let's focus on readmissions reductions. And so once you have a data set prepared, let's say you've gone and pulled the columns that are of interest, you have you know, some fields describing who's been in your hospital, who's returning or not in the past, you want to do some feature engineering. And you, you may have heard that. We often call a column a feature. In terms of machine learning, that's a word that'll pop up a lot. So Mike, what, what are some feature engineering steps that come up quite a bit? Oh, uh, you, might, you, know, you might have the patient's birth date, but the more relevant thing to get from that would be their age. So you'd have to you know, do like a transformation to get you know, today's date minus their birth date, and that'll give you their age. Yeah, exactly. And that's the kind of thing that we've tried to make super simple in healthcare AI. So if you notice in this help screen, we have all sorts of functions down here. And we'll be organizing these over time, but the idea is right here you have a function count days since first date. And so that function will take the date field, like Mike mentioned, and transform it into days since you know, birth, days since hired, things like that. And you can look at and see these other functions, but what are some of the other ones you've seen pop up frequently, Mike? Uh, well, I don't think this one's in healthcare AI, but it, it would be useful, like to convert a latitude and longitude coordinate to a zip code. Oh you know, yeah, we could do demographic information, and we use demographic information in healthcare AI, so that would be a good one to it have. It makes sense to have that. Uh, we'll, Definitely, we'll put it on the roadmap, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, and that's the thing. You know, as you guys come up with these functions, let us know what we can do better and make uh, what we can put in the package to make your life simpler. We want to be able to help you. And so there's other things as well, so like imputation. Sometimes you'll have columns with that are missing data entirely, or they're missing too much data, and so you need to maybe take those out, or you know fill in those columns with uh, the column mean or something like that. But that's different from feature engineering, right? That's more into the data cleaning. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Sometimes you hear like pre-processing mixed with feature engineering. So we, we try to help with a little bit of both sides of that coin there. And what's the what is the difference generally between those two? Yeah, it's somewhat fuzzy, but maybe we could call, you know, pre-processing is like doing some calculations to even get your, you know, it's, it's fuzzy. So pre-processing is maybe like cleaning the data, checking, making sure that there is actually data there in the columns mm -hmm. and that there's not nulls. Not nulls I, I think so. a feature engineering more of like converting a lat long to a zip code, like yep. something that lets the machine learn and then rather than just cleansing. Data cleaning being more like making sure that a string is actually has a value in it that you want to use and that all the dates yeah. are in the date format, things That's like that. That's a great question. Yeah, so we're, again, trying to put that all in here. And so once you've done that step and you have your data and you've transformed your columns into something that's helpful to the machine so it can learn, what you do is you, you, you can read the, the steps here and we say, okay, well, generally, after feature development, there's a two-step process. And in the first step, you're comparing two different algorithms. And we've talked about these a lot. Lasso and random forest. Robust, fairly easy to use, and apply across a lot of different use cases. So if we show just a little bit of code here, we won't show too much of this, but if we click in and show random forest development here, we'll, we'll walk you through just a little bit of the code. And let me just, so you notice as we scroll down, we have different arguments that we describe. We have you know, some other links there in case you need to back to the home page. And then we have examples, which is where you want to spend most of your time. And you'll notice in the examples here, we start out with an IRIS example. You've heard of this IRIS data set before? Seems to be a it? popular one. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's out there in every healthcare you know, package, it seems like. And it's a way to easily get started because it comes with um, R. And so if you scroll down more, you'll see there's a CSV example. So if you're working with flat files or CSVs, here's how to get started with those. And really quick, we'll talk about this SQL Server example at the bottom here. So what we want to do, and if you're following along at home, now or later, you simply copy this code and put it into this script window at the top. If you don't have that window, you just click File, New, Our Script, and copy that in there. And We'll just talk about a couple of these steps here. So at, at the start, we're connecting to SQL Server, you might notice. So is that typically the case, Mike? Seems like it is for, uh, for healthcare organizations. A lot of them use SQL Server and, uh, and Windows. So that's kind of why that, that functionality is in there and not something open source like Postgres. 
Um, but we're excited to you know provide support for other other SQL engines as well. Yeah, and the nice thing is is that if you look at the CSV example, you can write your own little you know Postgres or MySQL connector such that you can work with those databases if you want. Again, just look for that CSV example. And so if we step through here, you'll notice, okay, we're connecting to SQL Server, pulling in the data, and we're setting up some arguments here. So we're saying, okay, classification. Um, what does that mean? So, so classification would be, you know, are we trying to predict a yes or a no value? And, and just so we can see how it fits into context, so far the steps we've covered are, are you know, we, we picked our business question, so you know, maybe it was a user suggested that uh, maybe we try predicting patients who are likely to no-show their appointments. And that, that's actually a great use case because it, it can really uh, encourage efficiency within a practice because they can double book a slot or use extra reminder calls. Uh, and so that's a great use case. We can move forward because it's classification. So, you know, we'd have to go find a data set somewhere. That's step two. And then we'd have to clean the data and engineer features so that we actually get some use out of it. And then we're ready to come into the code and define that it's a classification model predicting yes or no, the patient will or will not no-show. Yeah, yeah, don't be intimidated. So if you've you know, played with various languages in the past or if you're fairly tech savvy, you don't have to worry too much about the data cleansing and feature engineering step. You could you know, maybe go back to that a little bit later and work on it a little bit more if your model's not as accurate as you would have hoped. So just dive in and you can kind of iterate from there. So the idea is, again, we're specifying classification because we're predicting 30-day readmit flag. So you'll notice in this argument list right here, we're setting up the, the model that we're developing. And we're saying, OK, well, yes, we want to do imputations. So we want to handle those um, null cells, put something in there. We have a grain column. Grain column, some people kind of you know, raise their eyebrow at that. Do, well, what's a grain column? So a grain column is well, some, it's sometimes called a key column, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of like the, it's the, the patient ID, but not necessarily the patient ID visit. So, you know, if patient one has come to the, to the clinic three different times, they'll have, you know, unique uh, visit IDs, but their patient ID will always be one. And so the grain ID is, is kind of the way that you tie, you know, those three lines from that one patient to that one patient. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And Great point, Mike. Some of the models don't take advantage of it, but some of Yeah, them really, you know, this isn't necessary. So if you have it in your data set, you can type, specify it there, but you can also just delete it and it works just fine. So let's just simplify that for right now. And we're predicting 30-day readmit flag. So again, this is the yes, no column that we are predicting, pretty straightforward. And we're going to use one of the processors on the machine. That's just the default. And so down below, it gets a little bit more exciting. We get to the algorithms themselves. And so we're trying to compare a lasso and a random forest. Before we, before we get there, can I, just, can I interject? We had someone uh, suggest that you know, maybe you could use weather data to predict no-shows. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so like, what, what's the functionality of healthcare AI to use data from external sources? Yeah, that's a great question. So the idea is that in healthcare, it's typical to have a data warehouse, or they're, they're fairly common. Health Catalyst does a lot of data warehousing. And so the point of that is to pull in all these disparate data sources. So things like claims data from your health insurer, or you know census data, or even weather data. So we're actually working with some people that are interested in looking at air quality data and how that might affect things like you know, asthma ex exacerbations. And so if you can pull into your data set, Healthcare AI will quickly help you see, okay, well, is the air quality data affecting my you know, readmission rate or not? Should that be part of the model? Mm. It's a great question. Yeah, and then uh, on a related note, you know, we said it's SQL Server primarily, but does the version of SQL Server matter, whether it's 2016 or 2014? Yeah, I think we're fairly robust. I haven't played around with anything prior to 2012, but you know, give us a whirl, let us know, and um, we'll, we'll fix it up from there. That's a great question. And so it, keep them coming. That, that's super helpful, by the way. This is meant to be interactive, so we love that. As we step down, and, and please um, you know, keep them coming. So we, we have two algorithms here. We're going to say, OK, algorithm, meet data, give us model. That, that's kind of the equation, <laughs> if you think of it that way. That is a good way to, to think about it. Matching it. Yeah, an algorithm with the data gives you a model. And if you think of a model back from like your high school or college stats class, a model could be something as simple as like a 
a line, you know, some linear thing that's fit, that compares square footage with house prices or something like that. So we're doing something akin to that, just a little more complicated, but Healthcare AI helps kind of take away the, the rough spots and the complicated pieces. And so what we do here is we compare these two different algorithms and we say, okay, well, let's pull in the data and see how well these algorithms do. And so we'll make this screen a little bit bigger there. And what happens is you have an actual accuracy measure or performance measure. And so first is lasso, as you notice right there. And what we see is, okay, for lasso, the area under the rock curve is 0.74. And we're going to compare that to the random forest result. If you scroll down, area under the rock curve for random forest is 0.97. And, and so what does that mean, rock curve? Well, I guess we don't have to go too much into it, but higher is better? Yeah, higher is better. So at, at a high level, a rock <coughs> curve is a, is a really robust way to evaluate machine learning classification algorithms. And the value spans anywhere from 0.5, which is like you flipped a coin, to uh, one, which is perfect. Yeah, so the random forest, thank you, uh, random forest is doing pretty well. And so what, what you did at this point is say, okay, well, you know, maybe I want to get closer to one. So maybe I'm going to pull in some new columns. I think I can get some more columns based around, you know, length of stay or read missions. And so you can pull those in, see if random forest gets you even closer to one by redoing what we just did here. And then w what happens after that? After that? Yeah, you have a good model, you know, you're close to one. Or yeah. you, but in reality, you don't really get that yeah. close to one. Maybe, you know, 0 0.8 is considered Yeah, actually, I had a formative. question about that. So the, you have your lasso rock curve there, it's 0 0.74. Is that good or bad or, you know, should you be worried? Yeah, great question. So, you know, it depends. It's hard to say. If you're doing something that's very clinical and you're dealing with cancer patients and the treatment optimizations, then you want something 0.9 and up, but you know if you're predicting no shows and it's okay if you are calling people that maybe you know would have showed up anyhow. If you're missing with no show prediction, it's not the end of the world. Got but it. when you're doing cancer treatment, a lot of these clinical issues, then and you want to have a lot more performant model, you know, up into the 0.9 arena. And really, you know, 0.8 is a, really as far as you can get with a lot of the clinical use cases. And you know, if you talk to your physicians, and you know, maybe it's an accuracy they're okay with. Yeah, and I think it's worth keeping in mind, too, that a lot of times a 0.74 is going to be leaps and bounds ahead of what they're currently using. Yeah, so, exactly. You have to compare against, well, what do we have now? That's a great point. So, so you asked what we do next. You know, we got a good model, and then, so we've, we've, loaded, we've come up with our question, we've loaded our data, we've cleaned our data, we've played with the different algorithms, and we have a model with, with a feature set. Did we... Did we yeah. Did we, did we prune features So yet? that, kind of. So let me just interject really quick. That's a great point. So the nice thing about last one around a forest is you'll notice it gives you an idea as to what factors most influence your prediction. So right here we see, oh, gender flag didn't help at all. So let's take that out of the model if we can. You know, it's not really helping. Why leave it in there? And so let, let's imagine you've got to the point where you have a good tight feature set and your model's performant. Where do you go from there? So from there, you're ready to go into, onto the production server and, and start surfacing predictions every day. So you can actually just save the model to, the, to your desktop and then put it up on the production server as a, as a model. And then whenever a new, new patient comes in, their row gets entered into the table and it gets run through the model and uh, a prediction is generated for them. Yeah, so that, that's where a lot of people get stuck. You know, a lot of papers come out saying, oh, such and such research group created the model and it was performant and it was on this cool medical data, but oftentimes they get stuck and you hear later on, oh, well, such and such health system didn't actually deploy the model or it's not being used to enhance patient care. Part of that is academic, it's because it's academic research, right? Yeah. So they have, there's hoops they have to jump through before it gets surfaced to actual patients. But then the other part is that it's just hard to do that. Yeah, you know? it's hard to integrate with you know the ETL servers and get the IT folks involved and know how to, to, to wrangle all the folks that are relevant to that question and then just have the, the software to do it. So that, that's one of the things that this package helps out with. <clears throat> so let's quickly jump to that deploy step and then we can take some user questions after that. So notice in our studio, it's very easy to jump back. So here's where we were and we're clicking back to the main page and you see we have random forest de deployment 
So let's say we want to go and deploy a model. So we click through that. You notice again, it describes what it does. We have a description of each of the arguments. And most importantly, example code. So if you scroll down, you can see an example with CSV data. You can see an example with SQL Server. So we'll just stick with that SQL Server bent real quick. And it's nice, those examples are just so helpful because, you know, writing all this, it's kind of like when you're, when you're learning a language, for instance, it's much easier to see a, see a foreign word and, and know what it means than it is to come up with that organically. Oh, right? and it's kind of totally. like that with the code. Yeah. So, like, it's hard to write this whole code block, but if you, if you can see, you know, oh, the, the you know, prediction column needs to be length of stay instead of uh, readmission, you know, you, all you have to do is follow the It's nice to have, there. like, a, you know, a, way, a place to start, really. Yeah. And so if we look at this, again, you're loading from SQL Server. This will look fairly familiar. You have a query, you have a database, and a server you're pulling from. And if we scroll down, let's say we've got the data into our studio, what you'll notice is, okay, well, you can remove a column if you need to. Maybe you, you know, maybe you could do that in the query if you want. But the idea is that you have this argument list, like what Mike was mentioning, where we populate it for you for a, a typical case here. So in this scenario, we're predicting 30-day readmissions. And we're using the patient encounter ID as our key column. Mm -hmm. you know? Plausible scenarios, right? We're doing classification again, but what's the the main difference here? We have something called the use saved model flag, and so what is this about saving a model? What is so the saving the model is you know after we've decided our model is a good one, we need a way that we don't want to have to retrain it every time we want to generate a prediction. Well, wait, why though? Because retraining takes time and it takes computational power and. Uh, you know, you don't want to be using the server's resources to do that. And the other thing is consistency. You know, if, if you're using a saved model, you know what's in that model. Yeah. Because you've evaluated on, on test data set. We had a user ask uh, if that AUC was calculated based on the training data set. And that's, that's kind of a sticky sl situation. You don't really want to do that because, you know, you might not be able to generalize to new data well. So the, the area under the curve to answer that question was calculated from the test data set, which was held out during model training. Mm, that's a good um, point. But you know, we, we know we have some idea of how that model behaves. And so if we were to retrain it every time we had new data, we'd also have to reevaluate it. And that would just be a headache. Yeah, so you don't want to be doing that every night. So the idea is you train it, save it, so that it's a, on a file on your hard drive, and then you can put that wherever you want, like Mike was mentioning earlier. And once you've saved it, you know, in that file that you associate with the, the model, so that there's kind of two different files. So you have the script that has the R code, and then the file that's holding the model. And in the R script here, you'll specify as to where this prediction is going. So typically, you know, in healthcare often, you're going to things like a SQL Server database. You'll point to the particular schema and column, or table rather. And the idea is that these arguments are all set up for you right here. So it's very simple for an analyst to get started or even a data scientist to save a lot of time. And then each night after you save the model and put it wherever you need to, you'll simply be putting new rows against the model. So let's say that Joe comes into the hospital. Joe? Yeah, we Joe. always use Joe. Joe, yeah, Joe's got a lot of issues, see? And so he's in the hospital a lot. So Joe comes in, maybe we know Joe's you know, weight, his cholesterol numbers, his blood pressure, and we want a, a score as to his likelihood of being readmitted to that hospital within 30 days. So we run his row against that model, and that's where you get the prediction. And that's you know, what drives more efficient clinical care. So you know, the physician is able to look at this and say, OK, well, maybe he needs more resources than these other folks because he's very likely to be readmitted. That, that's kind of the full circle picture there. Do we leave anything significant out? I guess the only thing is, you know, we. The only other thing, so I'll go through the process one more time just to keep the high yeah, level. Yeah, kind of wrap it up there. So we've, we've gone, you know, we picked a question. It was 30-day readmissions here. We, we found a data set we liked. We cleaned it up. We engineered features. And then we did this iterative model selection process where we tried lasso. We tried random forest. We found that the random forest was better, you know, maybe because the data has some nonlinearity to it. Random forest handles that well. Uh, and then we, we saved the model, we moved it to the production server, and now it's serving up predictions kind of any time a new patient comes in. So at this point, yeah, what do we need to do? That, that's a great, great spot. Um, so one thing that we should mention is that it's often 
the model's a lot different in terms of performance, like on retrospective data versus in the wild. Mm. So the performance you see using healthcare AI may, you know, that performance may degrade after you put it up on the production server and get these new rows coming in each night. And so what we often recommend is that if when you put it into production, wait some time before letting the clinicians know to use it for guidance. You know, if you're doing 30-day readmissions, leave it up there for more than 30 days so that you get the actual results coming in. You can see whether Joe came back within 30 days, right. Sally and whoever else. And then you can see, okay, well, yeah, we are actually at that performance level that we thought we were. And the package has, you know, helper functions for that as well. And then you're able to check and say, okay, it was performing like we thought. So, yes, let's surface it in yeah. Quick View or Tableau. Let the clinicians use the output. And, you know, you mentioned that, you know, sometimes the performance drops off when it goes into production. And, you know, we don't want to make healthcare AI look bad. But sometimes that's just because the data source is different, right? Yeah. So, you know, we do that 80-20 split to be able to get accuracy. And perhaps that's not representative of, you know, data that we'll be using in the wild, things like that. Sometimes there's um, target leak where, you know, in the EMR, sometimes the field you're predicting is populated before these other fields that are driving the prediction, and sometimes you only learn that till later. But well, well, in the future episodes, we'll actually go into tricks and tips that you can mm. use to, to make sure that your performance in the wild is actually as good as performance on past data. And then, and then what about uh, retraining the model? Do we, you know, we don't want to retrain the model every night, but, you know, it does make sense to retrain it every couple of months, right? Yeah, so it's good to check in, you know, put a note up on your calendar, maybe every quarter, and you can even automate this so you could have something, a script running nightly that just shoots back some performance statistics so that you're able to see, okay, well, is my performance degraded substantively? Do we need to retrain? Was there some change in the underlying data? Things like that. Great. Yeah. So I guess that's that's the process. You know, we've we've seen it at a high level. Uh, if you want further resources on you know what that pipeline looks like, a lot of the the MOOCs that we recommended last week kind of structure their courses based on what the data science process looks like, um, or the model building pipeline. Um, a lot of them have overviews. There's that great overview course from the show notes. Oh, last that was week. fantastic! Check it out. That was almost entirely just based on the pipeline. So, you know, you could check those out if you want to cover. We have a few questions from users. Oh, let's do if, it. if you're still feeling up to it, Levi, I know I am. All right. But uh, you know, somebody's asking. Uh, Paul uh, Bolson is asking if if we're working at all with genomic data. Oh, great question. So that, that's kind of the, the holy grail. You know, pre precision medicine. That's the future. So imagine not only using EMR data and things like cholesterol and BMI to predict readmissions, but actually knowing that person's DNA you know, for cancer predictions. We're not doing that yet. That is on the roadmap. And it's really based on health systems being able to get at that data more and more. It's just a matter of the data availability. I, I got to say, though, coming from a radiology background, I, I think radiology is the holy grail. So Everybody has their holy grail, I suppose. <laughs> we'll have to agree to disagree there. And then we've also had a question uh, on, on getting the models actually into, into use. So it's one thing to have it in production, but, you know, Paul also asked, how do we, do we ever encounter resistance from clinicians not wanting the model to influence their decisions? Or, you know, yeah, how, how do we deal with that's, that? Yeah, that's a great question. And so the idea is that you want to help build trust in your model. Clinicians are skeptical, you know, which is good. And if you don't provide an explanation as to why your model has said that Joe's high at risk, then they're not likely to, to accept it and to use that guidance. And so what we've done with Healthcare AI is you'll notice that, and we won't show it here, but the idea is that not only are surfacing a prediction as to Joe's risk of 30-day readmission, but also the reasons why, you know, the top three columns as to why that risk was so high. So the clinician gets, okay, well, yeah, that makes sense for Joe. You know, maybe he was older, or maybe he did have really high cholesterol, things like that. So I think, I think we have time for one more question. Let's do and, it. And uh, it's a good one. It, it's just, Jonas is, is looking for, uh, if we could describe what a production SQL environment, or a production server or environment might look like. Yeah, um, do you want me to take it, or? Sure. Yeah, so oftentimes these large health systems will have these Windows servers. So it's different from you know Windows 10. It's actually a different operating system. These they're often called ETL machines or EDW for enterprise data warehouse machines. They'll have maybe 100 gigs of RAM, maybe 16 processors, which is you know a lot different from our, our laptops typically. 
so that, that's kind of the hardware and software side of things, but typically they'll be refreshing these data sources each night. Maybe they have a warehouse and they're pulling from the EMR and they're pulling from claims data. And so these are the machines that are doing this compute each night to get the data sources ready that feed the dashboards that you know, administrators use, clinicians use. And they're, they're not optimized for web surfing like our computers, right? They're optimized for like moving data around. Yeah, and, uh, doing compute, exactly. Great. Well, uh, thanks everyone for joining us and don't forget to subscribe. We'll be here next week. Levi, thanks for the great show. Thanks, Mike. Great work. All right, see you next time.